Our Good Friday service will start in just a, a few minutes. I just wanted to begin by saying it's a lot different than any other ceremony we have throughout the year. It's not a mass. In fact, it begins in a very dramatic way. You'll see the three priests, Father David, Father Baby, and myself, Father Dave, will come down the aisle, and the first thing we do is we lay down flat on the ground. You know, all of the gestures that we have at Mass have a meaning. Standing is a sign of dignity. Sitting is a sign of contemplation. Kneeling is a sign of submission. Laying flat on the ground is a sign of death. We begin the Good Friday service by representing the death of Christ by that prostration on the ground. And then we will rise and have our scripture readings as usual. We'll have the very long passion narrative that the three of us will divide. And then we'll have a longer prayer of the faithful that involves uh, an introduction and a prayer for each petition. And after that comes the veneration of the cross. I'll bring in a large cross that will be placed here in front of the altar the three of us will venerate it, but simply by touching it, uh, and then our ceremony really comes to an end. It's really a very dramatic way that we represent the most compelling day in the life of our Lord that began his salvation for you and I. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection, sanctify your servants for whom Christ your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the Paschal Mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The first reading a reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so merit was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of sense of man. So shall he serve many nations. Because of him kings shall stand speechless for those who have not been told shall see, those who have not heard shall ponder it. Who would believe what we have heard? To whom had the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the perched earth. There was in him no stately bearing to make us look at him, no appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured, while we thought of him as stricken as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like a sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the shares, he was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away, and we, who would have told any more of his dismay? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten for the sin of his people, he grieved. A grave was assigned him among the wicked, and a burial place with evil doers. Though he had done no wrong, nor spoken any falsehood, but the Lord was 
pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I'll give him his portion among the bread, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death and was counted among the wicked, and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The Word of the Lord. Justice, rescue me. Into your hands I command my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. For all my foes, I am an object of reproach, a laughing stock to my neighbors and a dread to my friends. They who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead. I am like a dish that is broken. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be stout-hearted, all you who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy 
and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The Word of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Christ became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Curdon Valley to where there was a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a, a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground, so he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said, I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had his word drew it, struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus, Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its scabbard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and other disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciple, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then. The maid who was the gatekeeper said to Peter, he said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around a charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in a synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. 
When he has said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping word, and they said to him, he denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Again Peter denied it, and immediately a cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the petroleum. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled, so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, At this Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, in order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of death he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You say I am a king. And for this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. And everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again. Now Barabbas was a revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged. And the soldiers wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloth, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, Now, when Pilate heard this statement, he came, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him, so Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me at all if it had not been given to you from above. And for this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out,
When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Galagotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his cloth and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, and the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, in order that the passage of the scriptures might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them, and for my vesture they cost a lot. This is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciples, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge soaked in wine on a spring of his sock and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might be not might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one. The Jewish asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier, thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture's passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again another passage says, They will look upon him, whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of mare and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus, 
and bound it with burial cloth, along with the pieces according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, where the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. Perhaps of all the events of this Holy Week, this Good Friday maybe matches our mood and our feelings more than any other, focusing on the sacrifice of Jesus and all the sacrifices that we have had to make, both in our families and in our nation and really around the world. You might wonder, why is this day called Good Friday? In John 3.16, there's a beautiful phrase, one of the most beautiful phrases of all, that says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. What happened on Good Friday? We discover what gave actually means, what it really meant for God the Father to offer his son to the world and all the sacrifices that meant. His love has a special meaning in this COVID-19 season as well as we think about this kind of evil that's in the air, these germs that are unseen but kind of spreading through the, through the atmosphere, something in the air. I remember on a Holy Week many, many years ago, I asked a parishioner who was a policeman, just kind of absentmindedly, how was your week? And he told me the most compelling story. He said that unfortunately, earlier in the week, he had to arrest a young woman for dealing drugs, very dangerous drugs. This young woman also had three little children. And in order to test the quality of the drugs, she would actually give the drugs to her children to see the effect. Thank God they're safe, they're in foster homes now, and they're okay. But remarkably, the oldest daughter, who was I think in third grade, somehow knew that these drugs were bad. They knew, she, somehow she knew that these were dangerous. So to protect her two younger sisters, she took all of the drugs into herself. Somehow she felt that she was stronger and more powerful than her younger sisters. And so she took that sinfulness into herself. I can't think of a story that is more parallel to the example of our Lord who knew that there was a lot of sin in the world. There was sin kind of in the air. And so being of God, he took all that sin into himself to save us from the evil effects of people's bad behavior. It really was a remarkable story parallel to the story of our Jesus on uh, Good Friday. If you would like to see what sin looks like, look at the wounds of Jesus on the cross. And at the same time, if you would like to see what perfect love looks like, look at the face of Jesus on the cross. The cross can share so much. It can tell us how evil sin is, and at the same time, it can show us how powerful love is. No wonder that in almost every Catholic church, when you walk in, the largest thing that you will see is the image of an innocent man on a cross. How important it is for us to see that, to be able to see the consequences of our sin and to see the most powerful effect and saving power of love. Jesus was an innocent man. You know, before uh, the events of Good Friday, he actually prayed to his Father in heaven, Father, if it be your will, let this chalice pass from me. Maybe we don't have to do this passion. And God answered Jesus, the innocent man, by saying, no, but you are going to go through this passion. If I save you on this Good Friday, Jesus, then you will have a good day. But if you go through this passion and death and resurrection, then salvation has the possibility of going to the whole world. One person can bring that salvation to the whole world. And so Jesus goes through that passion, and by us experiencing that and having it in our life, then that salvation comes to us. This uh, Lenten season has been like oh, no other. It's been a time where we learn patience, we learn forgiveness, we learn compassion, we learn faith, we learn hope, and we learn love. Maybe that's why this is called Good Friday. God bless. Let us pray for all those who suffer the consequences of the current pandemic 
that God the Father may grant health to the sick, strength to those who care for them, comfort to families, and salvation to all the victims who have died. Almighty and ever-living God, only support of our human weakness, look with compassion upon the sorrowful condition of your children who suffer because of this pandemic. Relieve the pain of the sick, give strength to those who care for them. Welcome into your peace those who have died. And throughout this time of tribulation, grant that we may all find comfort in your merciful love through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis, that our God and Lord who chose him for the order of bishops may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Let us also pray for our Bishop Jose, for all bishops, priests, and deacons of the Church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty and ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gifts of your grace all may serve you faithfully, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our Lord and... Yeah. Let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that, having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty and ever-living God, we make your church ever fruitful with new offspring. Increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty and ever-living God, who gather what is scattered, and keep together what you have gathered. Look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness to his covenant. Almighty and ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty and ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth, that we ourselves being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God that, following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty and ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you come to rest, grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray also for those in public office, 
that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true free peace and freedom of all. Almighty and ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the world the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may, through your gift, be made secure, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and salvation to the dying. Almighty and ever-living God, in comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you, that all may rejoice because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Come, let us adore. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. 